Good morning. I'm Beth Coonan, and on behalf of the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 42nd Annual Iowa Women's Hall of Fame Induction Ceremony. I invite all those who are able to please stand while Girl Scout Troop 772, the East University Service Unit, presents the colors and leads the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance. We're so pleased that so many members of the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame are present with us here today. So I ask those uh, who are able to stand, please do so as I read your name. Janice Ann Barron, Mary Campos, the Honorable Joy Corning, Diana Finley, the Honorable Linda K. Newman, Mary Park Steer, Evelyn Valines, Connie Weimer, the Honorable Joanne Zimmerman, Renee Hardman, Jackie Easley McGee, Johnny Hammond, and if my spotters and I have inadvertently missed any of the other distinguished Hall of Fame inductees, I'd ask you to now stand and be recognized. Thank you. We'd also like to welcome all the past recipients of the Christine Wilson Medal for Equality and Justice. I'd invite you to also stand and be recognized as I read your name. The Honorable Celeste Bremer, Mary Weiberg, Naomi Christensen, and again, if we have any other Christine Wilson Medal recipients, if you'd go ahead and stand and be recognized now. Congratulations all, thank you. Among our distinguished guests here today are Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds, San Wong from the Iowa Department of Human Rights, uh, Mayor Ann Campbell of Ames, Janet Peterson, State Representative, uh, Bob Brownell, County Supervisor. If there are any other government officials in the audience that we've neglected to mention, please go ahead and stand now and be recognized also. Thanks to you all for being here. Lots of welcomes today, folks. I also want to welcome my fellow commissioners from the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women, Phyllis Peters, our chair, uh, Tom Carnahan, Sean Bagnuski, David Gudenkoff, Rochelle Hunt Russian, and Cheryl Wiesenand. If we could give them a welcome. And I'd also like to welcome our very talented and capable staff person, Kristen Corey. Uh, her dedication and hard work obviously make events like this possible, and so we're, we're grateful to have her, and we welcome here today, too. And last, but certainly not least, we would like to extend a warm welcome to all the friends and families of our honorees. So thank you for being here. The Iowa Women's Hall of Fame was established in 1975 to recognize women who have made an enduring and lasting contribution or achievement in their field, community, the state, the nation, or the world. 
The Hall of Fame Selection Committee is composed of four members of the Iowa Commission on the Status of, of Women and also two representatives from the public at large. Those serving this year from the commission were Rochelle Hunt Russian, the chair, uh, Cheryl Wiesenand, and David Gudenkoff, as well as Phyllis Peters, who served ex officio. Uh, the members from the uh, public were Jackie Easley McGee of Des Moines and Robert Tyson of Waterloo. So we thank you for your service. Before the presentation of today's awards, we'd like to remember the Christine uh, Wilson Medal recipients and Iowa Hall of Fame members who passed away this year. Dr. Uh, Jean Montgomery Smith, who received the Christine Wilson Medal in 1982. Uh, Twyla Parker Loomer, who was inducted to the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame in 1988. And Ruby Sutton, who was inducted in 2010. So with that next, I'd like to welcome San Wong to the podium. She'll uh, share some remarks with you and then introduce uh, the Honorable Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds. Thank you, Beth. Um, I'd like to at this time add my own congratulations to each of our honorees here today and to friends and family who've joined us. Thank you for your service and for being an example to women and girls everywhere, young and old, women of all races, ethnicities, and backgrounds. As Mahatma Gandhi once said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. And certainly, each of you in your own way have done that and an inspiration to all of us as to what it means to serve. To Grace, Angela, Michelle, and to Viola's family, thank you for being here with us today. We are honored to welcome all of you into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. We are also honored today to have Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds with us to participate in the induction ceremony and to proclaim Women's Equality Day. Lieutenant Governor Kim Reynolds is a former state senator and county treasurer. She serves as Iowa's 45th Lieutenant Governor and was elected Iowa's Lieutenant Governor in 2010 and re-elected in 2014. Each year, Lieutenant Governor travels to all 99 counties and enthusiastically listens to Iowans of all ages. She actively seeks to learn how Iowa can become an even stronger state. Since 2011, she has helped attract more than $12 billion in private investment to the state. Lieutenant Governor Reynolds has a passion for and works tireless tirelessly to promote STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math programs for students, especially the underrepresented and underserved in our communities. She chairs the Governor's STEM Advisory Council in Iowa. On the national front, she currently serves as chair for the L National Lieutenant Governors Association. A native of St. Charles, Iowa, Lieutenant Governor Reynolds enjoys the small town roots. She and her husband, Kevin, are proud parents to three daughters and seven grandchildren. We are pleased to have Lieutenant Governor Reynolds with us today. Please help me welcome Lieutenant Governor to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, good morning, and thank you, San, for that very nice introduction. I do have an update. Our youngest daughter, Jessica and Scott, we now have eight grandchildren. Uh, Embry is five months old, so our family continues to grow, and we are very, very blessed because of that. So uh, thank you for that very nice introduction. It truly is an honor to be with you today and be part of this ceremony to honor the 2016 inductees into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. You know, I want to express my appreciation to the Department of Human Rights and especially to Director San Wong for her ongoing dedication, hard work, and in really representing minority and underrepresented Iowans throughout our state. We appreciate all that she does. And also, I want to thank the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women for really establishing the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame, which, as Beth indicated, was established in 1975. And a special, special thanks to the commissioners who, uh, for their hard work in putting together today's wonderful program, and of course for your staff, because none of us do this alone, right? We all have great people and a great team that we work with. But, um, you know, as we have the opportunity to listen this morning to the accomplishments and the brief bios uh, of the inductees that we have the opportunity to honor today, let that serve as a reminder and really a reinforcement of the vital and diverse resource that women are to the state of Iowa. 
a state that includes women like Phoebe Sudlow, who was the first superintendent of public schools, Ola Babcock Miller, who was the founder of our state patrol, Willie Glanton, the first African-American female to be elected to the Iowa legislature, and of course, our new inductees, Grace Amamiya, Angela Conley, Dr. Michelle Devlin, and Viola Gibson. Our newest inductees include a woman who took her life experiences and used them to the betterment for the people around her through grace, forgiveness, and service. Or a woman who is only one of three female supervisors elected to the Polk County Board of Supervisors in over 150 years. Compassion, tenacity, drives her goals of making Iowa a better place, recognized as a county leader of the year. To a woman advocating for the well-being and health equality of at-risk minority women and their families, including over 30 years of in-the-field experience, making a difference not only in Iowa but on the global front. To a leader, a leader way, way earlier than we can even imagine and a true champion of human and civil rights for over 70 years. Bold, strong, fearless, compassionate, feisty. Are a few of the words that I've heard used to describe the women that we honor today, and I am so proud of them wearing those titles, they, they, they embrace it. Women who have shaped and led our state for years. So on behalf of Iowans, I want to thank you, along with our former inductees, for serving as examples for young women across the state that seek and need role models to emulate. And for your efforts in empowering and encouraging women to be involved and to seek out leadership roles in business, in their community, or in public service, to find their passion and to go out there and make a difference. And just as the Women's Hall of Fame was established to highlight women's contributions to society, both past and present, I true, too have tried to do a little bit of that through my Stories of Women's Lives tour. Um, I've tried to highlight and showcase how women are positively impacting our communities and our state with their ideas, their actions, their advocacy, and their ingenuity. It has, it's an effort to really kind of connect women leaders, a, a network of incredible women doing incredible things, who can again serve as a resource, a mentor, and a role model. Successful and inspired women making a difference. And I want to tell you, I have heard so many incredible stories of how women, of women who are making a difference in their homes, in their businesses, in their schools, and in their communities. Individuals who really do understand that Iowa's success is dependent upon placing diverse talents in positions of leadership. Now more than ever, and I say this a lot, um, Iowa has an opportunity to continue its unparalleled growth by unlocking the potential of all of our talents. And I'm proud to say we're doing that, but we're coordinating our efforts and we are capturing the synergy of so many great initiatives that were already taking place in Iowa. Initiatives like Nexus, like Iowa Women Lead Change, like NABO, Million Women Mentors, Epic Corporate Challenge, Invest in She, and I'm telling you, I am just scratching the surface of initiatives that have allowed us to start here when we go out there and talk about the important things that a women are doing in the state. In Malcolm Gladbrook's book, The Tipping Point, he explained that the tipping point is that magic moment when that idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold. It tips and it spreads like wildfire. And that is exactly what I believe is happening today in Iowa. A movement that's important for Iowa economic, for Iowa's economic vitality. A movement where women continue to shape the future of Iowa every single day. Whoops. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> and it's okay to have that happen, right? Okay. So, and I could really do this without reading it. I may be just a little bit uh, uh, biased, but I do believe this is an exciting time to be an Iowan. And I want to just say because of all of you, and because of all of you, and all of you, 
that this is the reason that it is an exciting time to be an Iowan. So again, I want to thank those who are being honored today. Thank you for your hard work and your dedication and for making a difference. And for your leadership, we know, will continue to pave a way for future generations of great w Iowa women to follow. So I look forward to working with all of you as we continue to ensure that Iowa is a state where all women can find endless success and opportunities. So thank you very much and congratulations. And I also have, on behalf of Governor Branstad, a proclamation that I would like to read today. And because they didn't get that in 22 font, like I require these days uh, for my notes, I am going to have to put on some glasses and read it. But uh, whereas the women of Iowa and the nation were granted the right to vote with ratification of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution on August 26, 1920, and whereas Iowans appreciate and understand the essential roles of women in our society and know that we must continue to advance the effort to ensure equal rights and opportunities for women. And whereas the value of women as politicians, as homemakers, business leaders, volunteers, and workers is still not fully recognized. And whereas women like Grace, Angela, Michelle, and Viola symbolize the diversity of Iowa, demonstrating outstanding achievements in their fields of academia, healthcare, civil in civic involvement, social justice, and education, to which generations of Iowans can look to, to these remarkable individuals as role models. And whereas the Iowa Constitution has been amended to read that all men and women are by nature free and equal and have certain inalienable rights, and whereas the state of Iowa is committed to eliminating inequalities in its laws and in its attitudes of its people and has made significant progress in that direction. And whereas women comprise nearly half of Iowa's full-time workforce, and whereas the state of Iowa affirms its commitment to advancement of equal rights for women through the work of the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women, and whereas Iowa's dedication to the principles of equality and fairness is an integral part of our state's foundation, and Iowans are proud of the progress made and are dedicated to continuing efforts needed to assure, ensure equality for women. Now therefore I, Terry Bradstead, Governor of the State of Iowa, do hereby proclaim August 26, 2016 as Women's Equality Day. Congratulations. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Reynolds. In addition to celebrating the achievements of this year's Hall of Fame inductees, we're also celebrating the great struggle of many women who gave us the right to vote 96 years ago. As Lieutenant uh, Governor Reynolds mentioned, the 19th Amendment guarantees all American women the right to vote. Achieving this milestone required a lengthy and difficult struggle. Victory took decades of agitation and protest. Several generations of women suffrage supporters lectured and wrote and marched. They lobbied, they practiced civil disobedience, uh, all to achieve what many Americans then considered an extremely radical change to the Constitution. In fact, many members of the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame helped in that struggle to guarantee that women could vote. But you're probably tired of hearing from me and from everybody else. I'm guessing at this point, you guys want to hear from some of the inductees. So I'll turn things over to Rochelle Hunt Russian to get the introductions underway. Thank you, Beth. Good morning. It is a pleasure for me to be here again with you at the 2016 Hall of Fame. For the second year, I've had the opportunity to be inspired, to be transformed by the journeys of so many extraordinary women across Iowa. The selection process was rewarding and challenging, as all of the women nominated were deserving of this accolade. As you will soon know, these four women demonstrated outstanding achievements in the fields of social justice, 
nursing, research, education, and government. As Iowans, we can be proud of the legacy these women leave for future generations of girls, women, and serve as role models for all Iowans. Commissioner Wisnan and me are delighted to share more information about today's inductees. Our first inductee is Grace Emma Mee. Originally from Vacaville, California, Grace Abada Amamiya is the youngest of six children born to Japanese immigrants on October 26, 1920. Her father and mother arrived in California in the early 1900s, were well educated, however, denied U.S. citizenship. They found employment in the farming industry. At an early age, Grace's father died, and she decided to dedicate her life to becoming a nurse. She raised enough money to pay her way through college and fulfill her dream of becoming that nurse. She started her educational journey by enrolling in the University of California at Berkeley and then transferred to the University of California Nursing School in San Francisco on December 7th, 1941. Grace's life changed forever. Grace and a friend were studying when they heard on the radio broadcast that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Within hours, Japanese citizens were picked up and told not to travel for more than five miles from their home. Two months later, Franklin Roosevelt signed an executive order authorizing the incarceration of more than 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans. At the age of 21, while still a nursing student, Grace was ordered to pack her suitcase and was quickly sent to Turlock Assembly Center, a first step in relocation to a camp. The assembly centers were often located at racetracks, stables, and fairgrounds. Grace joined her family in Gila, Arizona, her family was given just a few days to dispose of their home, pets, and other personal possessions before going to camp. Grace recalls this memory when talking with a reporter from the Ames Tribune, and I quote, we had to throw away and sell everything, leave only with what we could carry and go to camp. To us, it meant starting a life with two suitcases, not knowing where we were going, how long we were going. That was when we started our version of World War II, unquote. The camps were located in remote areas of the country. Japanese Americans stayed in camps for the duration of World War II. While in Gila, she leveraged her nursing skills at the camp to care for those Japanese and Japanese Americans who lived in nursing homes and were hospital patients before relocating to these camps. Grace was determined to complete her education and when her time at the camp ended. She applied to nursing schools across the country and the response from many of them were that, and I quote, they didn't need any more of her kind in their school, unquote. And admission to nursing school was denied. Finally, Grace was admitted to the St. Mary's School of Nursing in Rochester, Minnesota. She spent the last six months of her nurse's training as a senior cadet nurse in the U.S. Cadet Nurse Corp at Schick General Army Hospital, located in Clinton, Iowa. In spite of all the setbacks in her life, Grace has dedicated her life to serving others through volunteering at Woodward Resource Center YMCA, Special Olympics, and many other organizations. Grace, at the seasoned age of 95, often shares her story of the camp with those not familiar with this historic injustice toward Japanese and Japanese Americans. This story is a message of grace, forgiveness, and service through hundreds of speeches in Iowa and across the country. Zena Mursky, 
Associate Dean of the University of California School of Nursing describes grace in her own words, and I quote, Grace greatly impressed me with her enthusiasm, her engaging humor, and her dedication to community service. For years, she had visited schools and communities in Ames, Iowa, and other venues to ensure that people understood the injustices that had been wrought up against Japanese American citizens during World War II so that the government of the United States might never repeat them. Her focus is upbeat and un uplifting rather than bitter and recriminating and youth responded eagerly to her and her message." Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Grace Amamiya. Thank you so much from all of you for being here for us. And it's just something, like I said, such an honor to be considered as a student. Uh, <clears throat> as one of the inductees into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame, especially since I was born a Californian. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I must admit, that I spent more years in Iowa than I did in California. Of course, I had to leave California when internment came when I was 21 years of age. And then with my, uh, the rest of my life. And now that I am 95 and three quarters years old, <laughs> I, I feel that I spent over 60 years in Iowa, and it has been a wonderful experience, and I thank all of you Midwesterners for <laughs> the government and the city manager of Ames. Thank you. But anyway, I just want to say that it's been truly an honor and all. And my parents had come from Japan in the early 1900s. My dad was a lawyer, my mother was a home economics middle school teacher. And um, all of us uh, children, six of us were born in California. And of course, to, uh, we were told that education was one of the most important things in our lives and that to treat others as you would want to be treated yourself was our parents stressed that so strongly and we always felt that we were hopefully as American citizens we could be proud of the fact that we were the Asian Americans you know. This, in sharing <clears throat> the story of internment, we, ho we hope to be able to say what can happen to you when you start life normally, as I say. Again, I was in nursing after graduating from high school and school of nursing and all. And I've always wanted to be a nurse because I wanted to, my dad died when I was 10, and I felt that I should be able to do just something positive. And so that was what made me want to be a nurse so badly. And so after getting out of internment and helping with the internment nursing, 
I was able to finish my nurse's training. And then with Pearl Harbor, I felt that I wanted to help the soldiers and the shortage of nurses by being a nurse and taking care of our boys and women and being helpful anyway. And so anyway, may I say that uh, the, what the government did to us, we felt was not uh, one of the most negative things that the government had done. But after nursing in uh, uh, internment camps that we were sent to and working with the soldiers in the army hospital and all, and I felt that it was just really, truly, I'm so glad to be here. And our, we had the two boys, and the older one was mentally disadvantaged and all. And uh, so Special Olympics, like I say, was one of our very special, special things, helping others that needed help and hoping that we could be helpful at that time. And so may I also say that I thank you all for being here. Thank you for my family members from California and dear friends. And once again, I said I am proud to have been in Wicked School. I am pleased to announce the second inductee into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. That inductee is Angela Conley. To introduce Angela Conley, I think it's a fitting description to just read a quote from Henny Orr, Angela's nominator. Angela is known as someone who gets things done. She's feisty, she's fearless, and very tenacious but she is also in equal measure thoughtful, compassionate, and patient. When asked to describe Angela, Jean Meyer, former president of the Greater Des Moines Partnership and coordinator of the Capitol Crossroads five-year implementation plan remarked, and I quote, if a meeting was held yesterday, Angela participated. If it was held today, Angela attended. And if it's planned for tomorrow, count on her to be there. This honoree has stood at the crossroads of the Iowa Events Center, Wells Fargo Arena, and the renovation of Vets Auditorium and issues dealing with the courthouse. Frankly, she's everywhere, end of quote. <laughs> Angela Conley began her career in the 1970s in the Polk County Public Works Department as a zoning enforcement officer for nearly 20 years. In 1998, she was elected a Polk County Supervisor. The historic head-turning election gave Angela Conley the acknowledgement that she was one of only three women of female supervisors ever to be elected to the Polk County Board of Supervisors in over 150 years. Ms. Conley represents the second district, which includes the northwest area of Des Moines and Polk County, some in unincorporated areas, and that little tiny suburb just to the west called West Des Moines. <laughs> For Angela Connolly, community engagement has always been a priority. She enjoys participating in neighborhood organization meetings and civic activities, which is quite evidenced by her commitment and her leadership to the community. She, listen to how many things she serves on. She currently serves as co-chairman of the, uh, the Tomorrow Plan, Tri-Chairman of the Capitol Crossroads, a vision, 
a vision for Greater Des Moines and Central Iowa, say that three times, while also serving as chairman of Rebuilding Together. As a Polk County supervisor, she serves on various boards and represents our community quite well as the Des Moines, Metro, Des Moines Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, the Des Moines Area Regional Transit Authority, better known as DART and the buses that are taking you out to the Iowa State Fair, Greater Des Moines Convention and Visitors Bureau, Polk County Health Services, Riverfront Development Board, Polk County Housing Trust Fund, and Homeless Coordinating Council. I don't know what she does in her spare time. <laughs> wow. Angela is a leader in enhancing crisis services, such as championing a referendum to update three downtown courthouse complexes, facilities which will centralize the court services uh, that you have on Court Avenue, and also enhance safety. She was also one of the strongest supporters for the construction of the Wells Fargo Arena at the Iowa Events Center, which we all know has been a key driver in the revitalization of downtown Des Moines and in central Iowa. Her leadership role in many significant far-reaching efforts that have improved the life of Polk County residents. She is not content just to help Iowa's largest com uh, community and county of, of Polk County. She strengthened the communities and the economy of all of Iowa. For example, she's an advocate for our most vulnerable citizens facing mental illness. She's also been a strong advocate for women, children, and refugees in Iowa. She's a strong champion for a centralized intake system for over 20 homeless outreach providers. She continually encourages regional collaboration for increasing affordable housing opportunities in Iowa. She advocates for Polk County crisis and advocacy services for victims of crime. The majority, as we know, are women. And she leads efforts to increase linguistic and culturally appropriate basic human services for all the refugees in Iowa. As a native Iowan, Angela Conley was born to second generation Italian immigrants who owned a small restaurant, which became a second home for Angela and her three brothers. The Italian restaurant is where Angela learned hard work. She later attended Kansas University after high school to study liberal arts and in 1974 returned to Iowa to marry her husband Tom. Together they have three children and four grandchildren. Angela Conley won my heart last year in particular when she and fellow supervisor Bob Brownell went on a mission. That mission was to raise even higher awareness about Polk County's hungry population. You've seen her everywhere. She tirelessly works to send the message that no Iowan, no American, no one anywhere, and especially no one under her purview in Polk County should ever go to bed hungry. She doesn't know this, but one Sunday morning, I was sitting right behind her in church. And what she didn't know was I was watching her intently. Her kindness and her warmth was overpowering that Sunday morning. The infectious smile and the kind hello to everyone around her would melt even the hardest of hearts. She obviously has many friends, and she has many more new ones to come. It is with great honor and great pride that we welcome Angela Conley. Was a little overwhelming. <laughs> I have, no matter what size font, I have to wear the glasses. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. I, I want to start out by saying what an honor it is to be on stage with such awesome women who have achieved so much that for our state, and I'm proud to be in the company of 164 women before us who have earned this award. Thank you to Henny Orr, I'm sure she's somewhere in this room, who's the director of Embark, for nominating me for this award, and more importantly, for everything that she has done to really elevate women 
and advocate for all the refugees for our community. So thank you, Henny. And thank you to the commission and all the hard work for putting this together and for all the work that has done for the previous women. I'm proud to be standing here for all the achievements that all of you have done. I really am truly blessed. It's hard to believe that I have been a county supervisor for 17 years. Time has gone really, really fast. But you know, I wouldn't be here without the friends and support of my family and my friends and my colleagues. I want to thank you who, to everyone that has helped me get here. I wouldn't be here without you all. Representing Polk County has truly been an honor. And I can say that I really do enjoy going to work each and every day. Sometimes it's hard to believe, but I really do. <laughs> I've watched billions of dollars be invested in this community and seen firsthand the transformation of our metro area. Des Moines and downtown is no longer just a business center. It's really a destination where people want to live and enjoy, go to events, the culture and the outdoors. We have trails now. I have also enjoyed and watched the pleasure of watching some of the cities I represent in my district experience unprecedented growth. All those suburbs are growing unbelievably. Working for Polk County has given me the opportunity to work on a wide variety of projects. For example, which has been mentioned, in my time at Polk County, we have built two new community centers, which in my district gives seniors uh, uh, the ability to stay active, have a hot meal, be social, enjoy some activities, which is really a blessing when you get older to have seniors come together. It's one of my favorite things to do on Pi Day on Thursday is to go visit a senior center. We built Wells Fargo Arena, which was mentioned. We've had the renovation of Veterans Memorial Auditorium, which is a striking building. The Convention Center, we've had record-breaking revenues. Last year was $1.9 million. We've had concerts and conventions that are just awesome. If you've been downtown, you can see we have a big hole in the ground. We have a headquarters hotel coming up for Hilton that will allow us to compete with top-notch events similar to the men's NCAA March Madness that we hosted last year. We hope to get more of those type events. I'm also very proud of all the work we have done to help those that are most vulnerable in our community. Mental health has truly been a passion of mine and Polk County has recently been recognized by the White House only because of the hard work and the many people that have worked so hard in collaboration with many things that we do because we are the best in that business in my eyes. We have one of the best systems in our country. Over the years, we have built a continuum of mental health services that help, people, help keep people suffering from mental health problems out of our jail and out of the emergency rooms. Some services include substance abuse treatment. We have a 23-hour crisis center. We have a crisis stabilization facility, a mobile crisis response team that is second to none, and a rapid rehousing and many homeless outreach programs that are happening right here in our metro community. We have most recently focused our efforts, which was mentioned, thank you, for eliminating hunger. Today we still have, and I can't believe that one out of eight adults and one out of five children are still going hungry each and every day in Polk County. That's just not right. Nearly two years ago, Polk County formed a partnership for Hunger Free Polk County, and we've conducted research to identify gaps in trying to figure out what is the best gap, or figure out existing food assistance network. What we found is that existing services are just not available at convenient times. Some food pantries are open one day a week, a couple hours. They're scattered all throughout the metro area. So we're really trying to get a grip on what is happening in our community, and we really are, are almost there. We've added a mobile pantry to serve areas of our community that have a lot of low-income residents but no access to food assistance. So far, in the few months that we put this together, we've added 150 hours per week to the food assistance network, and we're seeing tremendous growth in the use and are consistently seeing over 50% of that growth are people that have never had access to a food pantry. We know we've got a lot more work to do, but we're up to 
up to it. I'm also so proud of all the accomplishments that I just spoke about, but perhaps what I'm most proud of about is my hope that I've joined all the other women honored here today in setting an example for young women in our state. All those before me know it's not easy to be a female leader in a male-dominated profession, but as the 60, 164 women in the Hall of Fame have demonstrated, we can achieve great things and make a lasting impact in our community by staying true to our beliefs and persistent in doing what we believe is right. Those are the things that my mom taught me early in life. I so wish she was here today to see me get this honor. I owe much of my success to her, and it is my hope to pass her lessons on to my daughter as she trailblazes through her career and my granddaughters as I watch them grow. My goals have not changed from the beginning of my career to create a better place for everyone, and we have made a lot of progress, but a woman's work is never done. <laughs> Seriously, our work is not about me or the other women before us. It is about leaving this a better place than we found it. It's about the legacy we leave for the next generation. Uh, so again, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you for all of you that have chosen me, and thank you. I'm blessed to be up here, this honor. And thank you to my family that are making noises over here. <laughs> And the friends who have supported me and my colleague that is here today, it is truly an honor to represent our great community and to, this, and to share this stage with women here today. So thank you. Congratulations. Our third inductee today is Michelle Devlin. As a professor and advocate, Dr. Michelle Devlin has devoted her personal and professional career to promoting the well-being of at-risk and underserved populations in the public health field. Dr. Devlin completed her degree in international public health at the University of California, Los Angeles, known as UCLA. Her specialty includes cross-cultural emergency and disaster response with refugee and minority populations. With a particular focus on women and children, she is a prolific author of over 100 articles, book, books, and publications, most notably Health Matters, a guide to working with diverse and underserved populations, and Postville USA, Surviving Diversity in Small Town America. Currently Professor of Global Public Health and Chairman of the Division of Health Promotion and Education at the University of Northern Iowa, that's quite a mouthful to say, <laughs> Dr. Devlin also serves as the Director of the Iowa Center on Health Disparities. This model organization is an entity established by the National Institutes of Health to improve health equality and equity to underserved populations. She is knowledgeable and an educator with over 30 years experience of providing training and technical assistance to thousands of law enforcement, public safety, search and rescue, disaster response, public health and emergency management professionals, all at the state, federal and local levels. She willingly serves nonprofits and disaster relief organizations around the world. She serves women and at-risk populations in multicultural communities. Dr. Devlin is the cultural awareness trainer for the Iowa Department of Public Safety and the Iowa Law Enforcement Academies. She is an international disaster relief team member and the, of the American Red Cross and having served us and done our nation well in Haiti and the Philippines. She has led multiple medical missions around the world in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. 
Dr. Devlin is a licensed emergency medical responder and member of Star One Search and Rescue Team in Iowa and the Iowa Disaster Medical Assistance Team, Disaster Mortuary Operational Team, and multiple FEMA community organization, uh, community emergency response teams, and medical reserve corps. She also has an extensive travel record. She's been to over 50 nations around the world representing us, and most notably served with the U.S. Army Corps of Civilians in Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom. Dr. Devlin is the recipient of one Iowa award, Richard Remington Award, the Iowa Civil Rights Award, and diverse Iowa local, state, federal, national honors for her outstanding teaching, her outstanding leadership, her scholarship, and as you can already see, her tremendous service. In his recommendation letter for Dr. Michelle Devlin, friend and colleague Dr. Mark Gray of the University of Northern Iowa wrote, from a personal standpoint, Dr. Devlin is a fascinating, high energy and inspirational woman. She pursues interests that inspire others, especially young women, to think outside the box and explore life to its very fullest. We have certainly seen that in the life of Dr. Michelle Devlin. It's with humility and great honor that today we welcome and applaud the service of Dr. Michelle Devlin. Ladies and gentlemen, our nominee, Dr. Michelle Devlin. I, I am overwhelmed. <laughs> I'm just really, I have almost no words to say. I'm just absolutely overwhelmed. I want to uh, thank the Lieutenant Governor and the distinguished uh, guests here, fellow uh, inductees, uh, both uh, in the past as well as my current colleagues, and the Iowa Department of Human Rights and the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women, because you all are fabulous and you're fantastic for all the work you do for all of us and have done for all of us here in the state. I thank you very, very much and for this honor. Uh, I also am very, very appreciative uh, for the various groups of friends that, uh, and folks that we have here uh, that came from very far actually this morning. I love you all. Thank you very, very much for being here. You're very kind. You get up at 6 in the morning, too, and drive in. <laughs> you're, you're awesome. You're, you're my soul, and I'm very blessed to have all of you in my, uh, in my life. Um, I also want to thank my uh, family members, too. They uh, mean so much uh, to me, and uh, unfortunately, we're not able to make it here today, especially my son, uh, Lieutenant Daniel Yehaley, who is serving uh, down at Fort Bliss in Texas on a three-week training mission, actually, so he is way out in the field right now. But um, I'm, I'm very, very humbled by this award, and for those, those of us that work in this area of immigration and migration and refugee services, uh, we tend to all know each other. You know, we've been doing, a lot of us have been doing this for a number of years, and so this award, I, I absolutely have to share this with a big team of other people that you know, as we go through this amazing journey of change that's happening in the state. And so I do want to uh, give special thanks to uh, my uh, dear soul brother, Mark Gray, who nominated me, a dear friend, a biz longtime business partner and mentor who, who's really taught me so much about the uniqueness of Iowa. And my soul sister, Janice Edmonds Wells, an absolute champion of the underserved in the state of Iowa. You're terrific. And a, and a much larger sisterhood as well of a number of other remarkable female role models that I have in my life and in their own way every day with their strength and their vitality and their creativity and commitment, they help improve the lives of everyone within the state of Iowa and families, uh, especially Lana Joram, Leslie Cohen, Sue Madison, 
and my uh, military sister, Shirley McLeod, my military mom's sister, Shirley McLeod. Thank you for what you've all done for me and for your support. Um, so I, I guess I'm you know, here listening to the story of Grace, who came from California. And again, I work in the immigration field, and everyone thinks we have all these immigrants in the state of Iowa that are Latino and Sudanese and Ethiopian, and we do. But it's the Californians that are coming to Iowa. So it's actually the Californians, you know. It's actually the Californians. Uh, when I first came here about 20 years ago from Los Angeles, uh, I am a valley girl. I was a valley girl through and through. They could not believe that I was moving to Iowa and uh, starting work at UNI because they were most certain that I would feel a very, very long way from home, especially in February, January, you know, <laughs> especially. But uh, in reality, like so many other migrants to this state, I fell in love with Iowa. I fell in love with Iowa. I fell in love with this land, as it's been called, of tall corn, green tractors, and good people. <laughs> and it is, and it is. And I have a very uh, special place in my heart for this state. And yes, I have now seen the butter cow probably 15 times, <laughs> eaten a lot of pie on lots of rag rides up and down all those hills. And we've even you know, raised our own goats and chickens and llamas and sheep and pigs and everything else on an acreage north of Cedar Falls. So we have fully embraced Ioana and the lifestyle and uh, all the, the culture here within the state and have thoroughly loved it. And it's been really, uh, it's been fascinating uh, to be here and actually ironic because I, I, I'm, you know, trained as an international health person, a global health specialist, did a lot of work internationally. But amazingly, over the past 20 years, the world has come to us now in the state of Iowa. And it is an absolutely remarkable place to live and to work with phenomenal people that are really trying to make, uh, make great change in, and uh, here within the state. And so I'm very honored, uh, again, to, to know a number of you here and be, been able to work with you, and especially to be involved with so many immigrants and immigrant and migrant women in the state, the moms, the sisters, the girls, the daughters, the grandmas, the aunts. They are amazing, and they come from every corner of the world, literally. Today in Iowa, they're white, black, Asian, native, Latino, different cultural backgrounds, Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, a wide range of faiths. They speak over 180 languages now here in Iowa, but they have the common link that they are all working towards building the best life they can for themselves, for their families, their communities, and for this state and country. So I'm truly honored to be one of these many new women of the world uh, in the state of Iowa, in this place that I also now call home. Thank you very much for this honor. I'm deeply, deeply moved. Thank you. Our final inductee into this year's Hall of Fame is Viola Gibson, posthumously. We are pleased to have Toyomi Igas, Viola's granddaughter, who lives in Los Angeles, California, and her grants. <laughs> and Daniel Van Arsdale from Seattle, Washington. They will accept the award in her grandmother's honor today. Thank you for coming. Viola was born Viola Willis on September 6, 1905 in Bethel Springs, Tennessee. At that, in, 19, in early 1900s, the population was 369. Today, the population, 713. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering who else is from Bethel Springs, Tennessee, the 47th governor of Alabama, Albert Preston Brewer. Viola was one of five children. Her father was a minister and a farmer. Her mother, a school teacher. 
At the tender age of nine, Viola lost her mother, and the family moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Viola dropped out of high school at age 14 to work and help support her family. Several years later, she returned to high school to earn her diploma. After graduating from high school, Viola Mary became the mother of six children and pursued a nursing degree. Professionally, she became a nurse and was also employed by the Red Cross as a home nursing instructor. Viola also studied at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois, and became an ordained minister in 1954 by the board of the Christ Sanctified Holy Church. She later became a pastor and served in this capacity for more than 20 years. Ms. Gibson became a trailblazer for social justice and civil rights in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The spark began in the summer of 1942. Viola's nephew was denied the use of the Ellis Park swimming pool in Cedar Rapids because of his race. Because of this practice, Viola organized the members of the Cedar Rapids community to establish the Cedar Rapids branch of the NAACP. She served as secretary for the Cedar Rapids branch for multiple terms, followed by serving as the president from 1948 to 1950, and again from 1953 to 1955. Thereafter, she remained an active member of the branch's executive board. Viola was also one of the founders of the Iowa-Nebraska NAACP State Conference and served as the treasurer for more than 15 years. Viola's community leadership and accomplishments were demonstrated by establishing the first adult evening classes on black history within the state of Iowa, advocating for the teaching of African American history in the Cedar Rapids Community Schools, representing the Oak Hill Jackson neighborhood on various committees for the mayor of Cedar Rapids, serving as a member of the Cedar Rapids Marion Council on Human Relations since its inception in 1961, and as a member of the Jane Boy Community House Board of Directors, among other community service organizations. Viola received many civic awards and honors, including, but not limited to, Outstanding Citizens of Iowa by the U.S. and Cedar Rapids JCs, Churchmen of the Year by the Cedar Rapids Marion Area Council of Churches, Outstanding Old Older Iowa, Iowan, by the Governor's Conference on Aging, Outstanding Black Woman, by the Black Women's Civic Organization, among other honors. In 1970, the Viola Gibson Park was dedicated to her namesake. On August 26, 2002, the Cedar Rapids Community District opened the Viola Gibson School in her honor. It is located in Northeast Cedar Rapids. Viola Gibson's faith, lifelong work in the church, allowed her to pour purpose, value, and determination into civic and community engagement. Spanning more than 70 years, Viola was a champion for civic, civil, and human rights for all. Viola once said in her own words, as quoted by Stephanie Winklowski, the sixth and seventh grade winner of the 2006 Write Women Into History essay contest sponsored by this commission, and I quote, I never did anything for recognition. I just did things because they needed doing, unquote. Stephanie is the daughter of Viola's nominator, Lawrence Winklowski. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Tayomi Igas and Daniel Van Arnstel on behalf of their grandmother, the late Viola Gibson.
Good morning. Um, wow. Uh, I'm uh, Toyomi Gibson Igus. I am uh, the granddaughter of Viola Gibson, and that is, as you know, is my cousin Danny Van Arsdale. And I would just like the rest of my Iowa Gibson clan to just stand up and just to show everybody that her family is here. My cousins. <laughs> And I brought my daughter with me from Los Angeles, and um, we're representing uh, the descendants of Viola Gibson to accept this Iowa Women's Hall of Fame award posthumously. Um, we have a family in, on the East Coast, we have family in Texas, we have family in Hawaii, they all wanted to be here, but unfortunately, you know, could not. But hopefully we'll do this justice. Uh, needless to say, we are thrilled that Nanny, as we called her, her grandchildren called her, or Mother Gibson, as she was known, um, is being celebrated by the state of Iowa, which is the home, her had been her home for the most of her life. Um, we particularly want to thank the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women, the Iowa Department of Education, and the State Historical Society for this rec recognition. As Rochelle said, uh, we found out that Stephanie Winkowski the young um, student at, my, at the school named after my grandmother actually uh, wrote an essay about my grandmother and that, that kind of spearheaded and motivated this whole nomination process with the uh, perseverance and actually the curiosity of her dad, um, Lawrence Winklowski, who is here somewhere. Lawrence, thank you very much. The entire family thanks you for taking the steps to do this. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Kristen Corey from the Office of the Status of Women for assisting Lawrence through the application process and for doing all the work of uh, trying to reach out to all of the Gibsons and various iterations of Gibsons all over the country so that we could be here today to accept this honor. Um, you already heard a lot about my, uh, my grandmother, Viola. She was born Viola Willis in 1905 in Tennessee. She died Viola Gibson peacefully in her home in Cedar Rapids in 1989, and as you heard, she was a very, very busy woman for 84 years. Um, not only did she raise six children through the de Depression, she educated herself, became a practical nurse, an ordained minister, and a community activist, fighting all of her life for human and civil rights and racial and religious tolerance. And she firmly believed in the power of literature and education to clear the way for compassion and understanding. Now, each of us Gibsons have different memories of Nanny to share, but, and we were hoping that my dad, he is the only surviving uh, child of Viola, could be here, but unfortunately, his health, he's now 84, uh, his health precluded him from traveling here, but he wanted you all to know that he shares all of our sentiments. But because he can't be here to talk about his mom and his experiences with her, Danny and I are going to share a couple of moments uh, that we remember about our grandmother. Um, for me, oh, she was my hero. <laughs> she was my hero. I was, uh, I was born here. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be so emotional. <laughs> um, but my father left when I was young uh, to uh, uh, join a law firm in Buffalo, New York. Um, but those early years were really formative years for me. Um, it was in Cedar Rapids in my grandmother's home and in her church and wandering through her garden um, uh, that I learned the values of the Gibson family, the values of the Midwest. Um, I watched her convene meetings and preach on Sundays right across the street in her one-room church, uh, watching from the pews, um, singing, playing the piano. She was also very artistic. She taught herself how to play the piano and, and she sang a lot. Um, I didn't know at the time, being five years old, that she was working on, you know, establishing this chapter of the NAACP or uh, doing all the community work she was doing. She was just my nanny, and she was there when my dad was going to school, and my mom was working, and uh, just there for me every moment of the day. Um, Viola practiced everything that she preached. I watched her embrace and support my mother, who came into the African-American community of Cedar Rapids directly from Nagoya, Japan. Um, my mother did not speak English and, of course, faced the, the discrimination that the Japanese felt in the, world, in the years after World War II. But it was uh, through Viola's home 
And the community that my mother went into, she felt accepted. She never felt discriminated there. She never felt an outsider or another person there. She never felt, she just felt welcomed. Um, Nanny helped my mom learn the language and the culture, not only of America, but of African America. It's a little difference. <laughs> it's a little bit different. Um, and through their relationship, I was witness to a kind of love, support, acceptance, and social tolerance that shaped my view of the world and I believe shapes the world of my children, I'm sure, of all of the offspring of Viola. Uh, she firmly believed that people had far more in common than they have differences, and that the more you know and understand about others, the harder it is to hurt or reject them. So that is why she did so much work even though her education was stifled a bit, in making sure that her children are educated, um, that the community um, was educated, that she started book clubs so that she could share knowledge and share experiences with others. And she firmly believed in all of that. Leaving Iowa and Nanny as a young child was really traumatic for me, as you could see. I'm still crying about it 50 years later. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I always knew where and how to reach her. Um, I still remember her phone number. Maybe you guys, some of the, some of the elders here, Empire 33217. Remember when there used to be an <laughs> Empire 33217? And uh, her address, 1132 13th Avenue Southeast. And as, 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 as long as I had that information, I knew I could call her, I could write her, and no matter where I was, I could reach her name. I wasn't here in Iowa when Viola accomplished much of what I had read about in the clippings. Her work with the NAACP, her church activities, her relationship with the Jane Boyd Community House, her ongoing community work, and her work with senior citizens as she got older. I wasn't here when her church was relocated to the Seminole Valley Pioneer Village or when a park was named after her, or when the Cedar Rapids Community School District chose to name a school after her, but none of those accomplishments ever came as a surprise to me. The way she lived her life was an inspiration to me as a woman, as a mother, and as a person of color. If Viola was here today, she would be so gratified that most of her offspring and descendants have gone on to continue her work in education, health care, law, community service, and ministry, through books, publishing, business, through the arts, and as loving parents and grandparents. If she was here today, she would have, what is it, six great-great-grandchildren. And if Viola was here today, she would say exactly what everybody, the quote that everybody has heard, I never did anything with for recognition, I just did things because they needed doing. And it's kind of interesting that that quote is now on the school at Viola Gibson Elementary School and is the one that stands tall and the one that people remembers um, the most. Um, but her family remembers so much, much more. And she was very, very special to us and we're very happy that she is special to you. So thank you. My name is Daniel Van Arzo, as stated earlier, and I was told, you know you have a good speech when some of your points have already been hit on. So <laughs> I'm really about that. And as the only XY chromosome representative <laughs> this morning, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm proud and honored to be here. Uh, I'm the son of Lillian May Carr Van Arsdale, Viola Gibson's eldest child and daughter of her first husband, Walter Carr. I'm humbled and honored to be before you today as Viola Gibson's grandson and as a child of her hope. She was known, as it's been stated, to her grandchildren as Nanny. We just knew her as Nanny. And this is, if you will, this is how I'll talk about her today. My mother and sister and I lived with Nanny for a while after my father passed. I want to give you more of that personal side that, much like with Toyomi, we, we just saw this side of her. Um, some of the earliest memories are of her humming soulfully throughout the house. One of her favorite songs was, I Shall Not Be Moved, and it was very significant. I recall long Sundays in church with people filled with the spirit, incredibly moving music, and Nanny speaking powerfully and passionately. I also recall Nanny taking me to meetings as a child, where I'd sit on the floor and play while adults conducted business. Little did I know this business was for me and for children like me and others. 
lobbying the Iowa congressional delegation to vote in favor of passing the 1964 Civil Rights Act, NAACP meetings, or her interfaith Bible group. And the focus always being to bring diverse people together for a common cause, to make our world a little better. I've come to realize Nanny's influence, along with my uncle's Hugh, who's his offspring stood up earlier, and my uncle Will, instilled in me a strong sense of social justice. I'm now a social worker out in Seattle area. And as I've grown older and hopefully wiser, I've learned to reflect on, draw from, and cherish that foundation. It's said that self-reflection is a humbling process. It's essential to find out why you think, say, and do certain things, then better yourself. For me, the journey of reflection has always come back to Viola Gibson and my experiences here in Iowa. Looking at her accomplishments, I find it phenomenal for her to stand up and speak out in a time when women, and more significantly, women of color, were marginalized and silenced. But then again, she always had a strong voice. I would like to qualify my earlier statement of my being a child of Viola Gibson's hope. When I was in junior high, I ran for student council president. I became the first black student council president in the history of McKinley Junior High School in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Naturally, my mom told me to tell Nanny. When I sat down with her, I was surprised at how moved she appeared by the news. She smiled. And in her broad smile, there was something else. Three generations of my family had attended McKinley, Nanny, my mother, my aunts, and uncles. And I was the first to be accepted by my peers, both black and white, to lead student government. I believe in my accomplishment, she saw change. This was the hope that drove Viola Gibson. And my accomplishment was that hope personified. The hope of what can be accomplished when we put content before color. This success was that definable moment for me where I realized I have the power to make a difference. I believe this is what drove Nanny. This is a powerful recognition today, very powerful. The story of a courageous individual, the story of courageous individuals standing up against great odds and repeatedly insisting there's another way until the belief is shifted from exception to the norm. And I think everyone honored today has done that. I would challenge each and every one of us to ask ourselves, how can I hold up the legacy of these women honored today? And in honoring them, is it for a moment? Here's the point. Or is it a movement? Because we can leave today and honor this moment. Forget about the energies and the sacrifices and the spirit that was told before you today. Or we can make this a movement. I know whose shoulders upon which I stand. I would contend our present political climate shows Nanny's work is not finished. And if we are not vigilant, the efforts of those we honor today can easily be diminished. Nanny said, I never did it for recognition. I just saw things that needed to be done. I challenge you to ask yourself, what things can I do to make a difference today? Thank you. Well, thank you, Toyomi and Daniel, for those moving words, and congratulations to all of this year's honorees. Thank you for your hard work, your accomplishments, and especially for being such excellent role models for the women and girls in our state. Your enduring contributions to the fabric of our state's culture will not be forgotten. We owe you a debt of gratitude for all of the work that you've done and all the work that you'll continue to do. Thank you to the commissioners, the selection committee, the uh, staff from the Office on the Status of Women for 
dedicating their time and passionately working for the betterment of women and girls in Iowa, and thank you also for your work on the ceremony today. We extend our thanks to Bows and the Florist for the gorgeous flowers you'll see outside, uh, to Mediacom for their in-kind donations, and I certainly would be uh, remiss if I didn't thank the uh, Friends of the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women. The Friends was created in 1987 to support the commission. Uh, Friends board members include Linda Bisgard, Carla Fultz McHenry, Emily Williams Busca, Michelle Durand Adams, Gail Toval, Amy Getty, Alexis Nicholson, and our Phyllis Peters. The Friends are sponsoring a reception held in the atrium immediately following the program, and they invite you all to attend and continue our celebration. The Friends Board has also created a photo frame for each of the inductees, and you're invited to help commemorate this special day uh, by writing a note on uh, those frames, and they're located out uh, on a table in the atrium. Please also feel free to visit the tables in the atrium following the ceremony to learn more about the Iowa Department of Human Rights the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women, and the Friends for the Iowa Commission on the Status of Women, uh, and also to learn how, uh, as a collaborative team, these groups are impacting the lives of women and girls in the state of Iowa. Thank you for attending the 2016 Iowa Women's Hall of Fame ceremony. We hope you've been inspired by the achievements of these amazing women. Have a wonderful day.